and welcome. Thanks for coming for our Controlled Environment Phenotyping event. This is a group of us that met through the International Plant Phenotyping Network, and we're going to be talking today about a number of different controlled environment phenotyping uh, facilities. Speaking today are Bettina Berger from Adelaide, the University of Adelaide in Australia, uh, myself, I'm Carolyn Lawrence Dill. I'm in the Department of Genetics, Development, and Cell Biology at Iowa State University. Marna Yando Nelson, she also is in the same uh, department as me. And then Astrid Juncker. So Astrid is here from IPK in Gotterslave in Germany. So our agenda is um, after I give an introduction, Bettina will be speaking, and then I'll come back and give you an introduction to Envirotron. Marna is going to talk a little bit about an experiment that she uh, has worked toward for Envirotron, and then there will be a quick break. Astrid's going to come back and talk about what they're doing at IPK, and then we have a lunch and panel discussion that will be moderated by Steve Howell, who's also from Iowa State University. And then at 1.30, uh, those of us who are in Iowa can meet out at the Envirotron facility for a tour. If you happen to sign up for that tour, or, or to fail to sign up for that tour, you can still come. So if, you, if we go through this this morning and you decide you want to go, feel free. Um, over the next few minutes, I thought I would tell you just a little bit um, about the International Plant Phenotyping Network, since that was really who brought this group together. So that network is an association of major plant phenotyping centers. Uh, the goal is to get people to coordinate, to increase visibility and impact, and to do the kinds of things that we're doing today, and that is to get together um, on topics that we share and figure out what we can do to learn from each other. So if you look at who is a member of the International Plant Phenotyping Network, there are a lot of people, especially in Europe, that's where these plant phenotyping networks began. We also have uh, members that are in, uh, clearly, Australia. You have Adelaide, also CSIRO, and others. So if you look around, you will also find some people in some uh, institutions, I should say, in North America who have joined the International Plant Phenotyping Network. One of them is Iowa State University. So within the International Plant Phenotyping Network, there are working groups. Um, one of the reasons that an institution would want to join IPPN, especially given that there is a fee to join, is that you can get money back on topics you care about. So depending on how active you are, IPPN uses that funding that is the institutional membership fee to fund working groups. Uh, and what the working groups do is to make proposals for get-togethers that they want to see supported. So the working groups include imaging for phenotyping, avoid, affordable phenotyping, root phenotyping, seed phenotyping, this one that's a jumble of letters that I will get back to, and data management. So that jumble of letters is the controlled environment plant phenotyping group, and that's the group that uh, is meeting here today. So the people that began that working group are Thomas Altman and Astrid Juncker. Astrid is one of our speakers today. But before we jump into the seminars, we've still got a few minutes, and this meeting today is in Ames, Iowa, in North America, and at the very least, a number of the people that are in this room uh, who are from Iowa State mainly and surrounding uh, institutions. Many of you may not know about the North American Plant Phenotyping Network, which is an IPPN regional partner. So I'm going to just fly through a little bit of information about NAPPN, where it came from, and how you can become a member and make use of the North American Plant Phenotyping Network. So this all began back in 2016 at the Plant and Animal Genome Conference uh, with money from the BBSRC and the NSF. A group of us organized uh, both some seminars at PAG and also uh, a Q&A discussion group where what we did was to try to figure out what mattered most in this phenotyping space where people wanted to work in high throughput uh, phenotyping and controlled environment phenotyping. Uh, so Ruth Basto, who at the time was at the Earlham Institute, was instrumental in this, and also Catherine Demby. So out of those discussions and presentations that were at the Plant and Animal Genome Conference back in 2016, 
we came up with topics that were ones that people in North America really wanted to push forward. Uh, we wanted better networking and collaboration. We wanted to see interdisciplinary training. It was clear that we really needed some data standards so that we could start to collect data in ways that we could analyze each other's data and aggregate data sets that were useful to us. And then finally, one of the problems has been that when you're doing things that are collaborative, uh, reward structures don't always match what it is that people would like to see happen. And so for community or organized uh, events and community uh, oriented get togethers, these kinds of things, you, you know, you've always been encouraged to do them, but it's not always clear that that's going to be something that helps you uh, via your organization. Out of this, we made the advisory white paper, and the next event that we came to was the North American Phenotyping Network inaugural convening event. So, one of the people that um, was instrumental in getting people together and making use of that white paper was April Carroll. April at the time was at Purdue and she organized this first convening event for the North American Plant Phenotyping Network. It was supported by Iowa Corn and uh, FAR. So people got together and articulated what the challenges were that they were seeing that this organization was going to try to uh, overcome and identified what was called pre-competitive areas. These are things that advance the entire community, not just one research group, not just one research topic. So the challenges that were identified were that it is difficult to interpret phenotypes in the context of environmental data. That's uh, sort of something that we all start with, and that we really needed some standards, but those standards need to be very carefully articulated so that we don't actually constrain the science. Sometimes when you only have one way to take data or one way to describe data, you start to lose a little bit of what uh, is possible to get out of those data. So we uh, articulated that it was in fact important that we not uh, restrain the science through too much uh, standardization. The areas that seemed to be ones that the whole community needed were uh, we need a place to put phenotyping data sets. Uh, we need those standards. It would be nice to be able to control lab to lab variability. One of the things that helps with controlling that variability is to really well describe how you do different experiments. So you expect everything that's being published and put out there with a data set to be so well described that someone could reasonably reproduce it, which is hard. And we wanted to be able to translate measurements to biologically relevant information and see a good deal of automation come out of this. So from that event, the group of us that organized the event came together and decided that if this North American Plant Phenotyping Network was going to advance, we were going to have to become what we later referred to as an ad hocracy. So this was a group of us that wanted to push it, and we knew that we had to push it briefly and then get out of the way. So at the Phenome Conference, which was in Tucson in early 2017, that group organized uh, people at the conference to articulate a vision, mission, mission, and values for the organization. We called for the creation of bylaws and agreed that what we would do to get out of the way was to elect an executive board that would carry on the mission of the North American Plant Phenotyping Network. So we created these provisional bylaws that you would all rather die than have me describe to you. The important thing here is circled, and that is the election. This was something that enabled this community-driven organization to be genuinely community-driven, not just by a few people that wanted to push it forward. So we had an elected board in 2018, and it involves both people from industry and from different universities. And there are some uh, requirements behind that that we definitely have members that are uh, in different areas. So we have people from engineering, computer science, and plant biology. And these people are drawn both, as I said, from industry and academia. In the first year, April Carroll was the chair, and I was the co-chair. And we had, we drew straws to create turnover so that year to year this group of people would change. Our 2019 elected board has brought in two new people, Frank Dolman and Andrew Leakey. And we even elected the group that hasn't begun yet. So 
We have a future elected board that will include uh, Tabare Abadi, Amy Tab, and Jennifer Clark. Why on earth would you do elections that are in advance? The reason was because we wanted people that were going to be upcoming on the board to have time to listen to our communications and discussions so that by the time it was their turn to make decisions, they weren't just jumping into something they didn't fully understand. So this is something we've done for future planning. If you want to learn more about NAPPN, there's a publication out there in the Plant Phenome Journal. The goal of NAPPN is not to replace, but rather to coordinate existing groups in different areas. So one of the things that is very clear to us when we look at our membership of NAPPN, we have a lot of plant scientists. That makes sense because that's one of the letters in NAPPN, and certainly it's the group of people that wants to figure out what's going on with these tools and methods. But we also want to bring in more people that are in agricultural sciences, engineering, physics, computational sciences, geoscience, and even mathematics, statistics, and data science. We need these people to be able to do phenomics, which is really just a way of uh, controlling and making sure that the data sets that we take are standardized and something that uh, all of the measurements are created in um, a reproducible way. So if you would like to join NAPPN, we have a website that if you just search for North American Plant Phenotyping Network, you'll find it. I should warn you both for being online and Twitter that if you tag or go to the wrong website, you're gonna end up with the North American Paranormal Association. So be careful when you type that in to see where you land. If you want to become a member, you can do that online through the contact or join tab. We also now have a member directory. There are affinity groups for NAPPN. We decided that we wanted affinity groups and not working groups because at least early on, we weren't going to expect anyone to do work. We wanted people to get together. And uh, you can look at who those executive board members are. Finally, we do have on that page also under facilities across North America, a list of facilities that you may want to become aware of and reach out to people at those facilities to determine whether uh, what it is that they have available as something that would be interesting and useful to you in your experiments. So with that, I'm gonna to return to this page and our next speaker is available. This is Bettina Berger. So I'm gonna give just a moment if any of you have questions. Well, if any of you need something uh, for NAPPN or you wanna learn more, don't hesitate to reach out to me. So Bettina is our first speaker who came via international flight she has a background in biotechnology and a PhD in molecular plant biology. She used a two-year fellowship at the Australian Center for Plant Functional Genomics to focus on the then emerging field of plant phenomics. Since 2010, she's worked at the Adelaide node of the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility. In 2015, she became the scientific director. She enjoys the diversity of working in national research facility with a whole range of different users research questions and challenges on a daily basis. Uh, Dr. Berger has focused on establishing protocols and methods for high throughput screening of various plant species in controlled environments using imaging technology to help the research community take advantage of the benefits that modern phenotyping techniques have to offer. With that, I will walk away and turn it over to <laughs> Bettina. Great. people online can hear me as well through the mic. If not, just write some comments and I'll hopefully see them pop up. So first of all, thank you, Carolyn, for organizing uh, this symposium. Uh, it all started with me having a trip to Nebraska and then sort of looking on the map and circling and seeing what else is there that I can do when I make the trip over all the way. So, as Carolyn mentioned, I work at the APPF, and I just want to give you a bit of background about uh, what APPF actually is. So, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, we have the uh, really great fortune of being funded by the Australian federal government. So, we have been created to provide infrastructure to um, all of Australia, but also internationally. So, users from all across the world can approach us uh, and use our facility. So it's not just users at the University of Adelaide or our sister nodes at CSIRO and ANU, it's really anyone can access that. 
um, and we operate both for uh, private and public uh, users. So as I mentioned, we have three nodes. Uh, I work at the Plant Accelerator in Adelaide. Then we have the High Resolution Plant Phenomics Center at CSIRO in Canberra. And we have a node at the uh, Australian National University in Canberra. And I'm just going to give you a bit of background about some of the hardware and infrastructure that we have across those nodes. Um, so really what we are trying to cover across the three nodes is anything from high controlled phenotyping of model plants all the way to field phenotyping and taking all those modern sensors that we now have available out into the field and really trying to measure plant performance. Uh, as I said, we are open access, um, so that's both for public and private users. And we can support anything from just people using our kit to acquire data and then go off and do their own analysis to the full spectrum where we provide full support all the way from experimental design uh, to the statistical analysis at the end. So in Adelaide, um, we've got a Lemnotech-based phenotyping facility. So we have four so-called smart houses, each with about 600 pot capacity. Um, we have automated imaging and watering that we can do on a daily basis, uh, mainly RGB uh, and steady state fluorescence. And in one of our systems, we also have a full spectrum hyperspectral imaging, so all the way from the visible to the short wave infrared. So, and with this set of both camera and watering, we can do experiments to non destructively monitor growth uh, and evapotranspiration over time. Because drought is obviously a big issue in Australia, we also had quite a number of people who were really interested in just using our system to water to wait so they can have controlled um, experiments. And uh, so to sort of support those people, we invested in so-called drought spotter platforms. We've got one in a greenhouse and two in two adjacent growth rooms. So these are gravimetric systems where you have 24-7 monitoring of evapotranspiration and very controlled watering at the same time. The two twin rooms have the advantage that we can also have, for example, a heat chamber and a normal temperature chamber next to each other to try and peel apart heat and drought effects, which in the field generally co-occur and it's very difficult to tell what is causing what and how do we identify plants uh, that are um, tolerant to one or possibly the other. And they also have um, controlled humidity, obviously, and we also have LED lighting that we can control. Um, we also uh, work with collaborators to cover field phenotyping. Um, so that's mainly using UAVs, but we also uh, collaborate with people using manned aircrafts and that is using a whole array of different camera systems from RGB to hyperspectral uh, imaging. We will also, in about a year's time, uh, receive a X-ray CT system, which can do root um, scanning when the roots are still in soil in the pots. But the main reason we got the investment from the GRDC to purchase this type of equipment is to image intact wheat and barley spikes um, to see, for example, for the frost trials, the heat trials and so on, which florets were filled with grain, which ones were aborted, how big is the grain, um, what is the estimated thousand grain weight for those spikes. So it's doing that at high throughput and getting very precise data out of it rather than just a visual assessment there's a grain or not. Uh, then just giving a brief overview of uh, some of the many things that our uh, nodes in Canberra are doing. So our sister node at CSIRO, they've invested a lot of time in developing new technology and integrating various sensors into functional platforms. So their Phenomobile Light is a field vehicle that can go over the plots, um, mainly designed for um, small grain cereals, wheat, barley, and so on. So with maize and sorghum, that would be a bit more uh, difficult at this point. But it's got a whole range of instrumentation that you can see here. 
um, trying to really capture as much information as we can from the plots at a pretty high throughput. So, for example, from the LiDAR, we can get a 3D point cloud of what the individual plots look like. We can get an estimate of the biomass, but also the distribution of leaves within that canopy. So we can look at traits like radiation use efficiency. How far does light actually penetrate into the canopy? Um, so they also invest a lot of time into validating those trade and indices for things like canopy height, biomass, uh, and fractional ground cover, just to give you a bit of example. And then we're obviously aware of the fact that data analytics is becoming sort of the next bottleneck in phenotyping now that we can gather so much data. So our CSR node is also uh, investing in a uh, sort of web-based software pipeline called PhenoSmart where users can upload their data and get trades out uh, at the end. Then our ANU node, um, they traditionally focused a lot on very high precision control of growth rooms and also doing dynamic growth environments. And Astrid will probably talk about some of that later on at a completely different scale to the small conviron chambers that we are talking about. But it's things like dialing up the weather and light pattern from Ames in 1998 and pre-programming your uh, conviron growth chamber so that it runs uh, that pattern and then monitoring growth of your model plants, Arabidopsis or Brachypodium over time. Um, they've also uh, only recently commissioned a whole range of so-called growth capsules or grow tainers. So these are um, controlled environment growth chambers in a shipping container. So you don't need a new building or anything to house it. You just drop the shipping container more or less in your car park, plug in the supplies and off you go. Um, and then they're also working on a whole range of status reporting and software tools uh, that they share with the community. The other aspect they are really interested in is um, virtual reality and how it can help us make sense of the wealth of data that we are generating. So how can we use virtual reality to reconnect with our data, explore it, walk through a 3D cross-section of our maze route, for example, um, and just use the technology that is available to uh, connect us with data. So now that I've given you an overview of the technology at hand, I want to sort of start to move towards the science, um, but not without a sort of a mention of caution before. I mean, we have been operating now for nine years, and one thing we learned fairly quickly and pretty much everyone embarking on the journey of uh, phenotyping, it's no plug and play. It's not a straight, smooth highway that you just race down. Uh, a lot of bumps in the way, a few potholes uh, and ditches, and it's, yeah, it's something that really requires a fair bit of effort. And you really need the right team. So this is our team uh, at the Adelaide node. And in-house, we're trying to cover the majority of sort of the phenotyping pipeline and expertise that is required. Everything from plant science, statistic, data management, to horticulture and engineering. Uh, as one of our technicians always says, there is no point in having the fanciest sensors. If you can't grow a plant, it's of no use. So having technicians that you know, know how to properly grow plants is not a trivial thing and really uh, essential. Because especially when you have such good senses, you realize that you know, planting and operational error is something that all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's something we actually have to take into account. So you obviously need the right team in-house, but you can't have everything in-house, so you also want really good collaborators that can cover the areas that you can't uh, sort of uh, cover in your in-house team. 
So for computer vision, machine learning, for example, we work with the Australian Center for Visual Technologies and the Australian Institute for Machine Learning in Adelaide. We also work with uh, some of our national e-research infrastructure uh, at PAWSI and the Australian Research Data Commons for Data Storage, Compute Power, but also supporting us in how to publish our data and data management. So now that I've given you all the background and warned you about what it's like to embark on phenotyping, let's start with the science. So most of what I'm going to talk about is really from our Lemnatec system, looking at growth over time. And at this point, we're really just looking at whole shoot and looking at uh, estimated biomass over time. So I'm going to talk a fair bit about projected shoot area, which is really just a proxy for our shoot biomass. So if we look at a traditional growth curve, you can see this S-shaped pattern. Um, and out of this growth curve, you can already get an awful lot of information. You can measure absolute and relative growth rates. You can look at point of absolute maximum growth, which is used for, for example, this inflection point uh, where you generally change from vegetative to reproductive growth. So how do we use this? Uh, this is an example from a drought experiment we did with sorghum and we used a forage and a grain sorghum. Forage sorghum is this very big plants here um, in the green curve under well watered conditions. And then we have the grain sorghum in red. And so this is the biomass estimate over time. But from this, if we measure the slope, we can get the absolute growth rate. And you can see this bell-shaped curve. And those peaks are generally the point where the plant then changes from uh, reproductive to, uh, sorry, from vegetative to reproductive. And what is interesting, you can see that this peak under well water conditions is a lot later than it is under the drought conditions. So what happens is the plants almost follow an escape response. They know I don't have enough water to invest in too much biomass. I need to sort of hurry up and flower earlier. And that we can measure just from the growth rates. We don't actually have to physically necessarily look at flowering time or the Zadok scores or other um, developmental scores. We can get that out of the images. And we can also see, for example, that that shift differs between the two different uh, uh, varieties we had in this case. We can do the same in barley. This is an example uh, of cultivar clipper that was grown under well water conditions and uh, water limited conditions. And again, you can see this shift into an earlier booting and earlier peak under uh, drought conditions compared to the well watered. And these are the images corresponding to the well water plant in 46 days or uh, 39 days under the drought conditions. And you can see they're both at roughly booting stage. And we can then use that at a larger throughput to screen, for example, a population. In this case, we were looking at introgression lines. So that was a reasonably small panel, but it had introgressions of wild relatives of barley into the elite cultivar scarlet, covering the entire genome. And we can see that this uh, black line here, which is uh, line 121, um, that performed a lot better than scarlet under both control conditions and also under drought conditions. And we know that it has um, an integration and 4H in this region here. And another line that also has a 4 age integration, 117, but at a different position, uh, performs a lot worse. So we know that this area here quite possibly holds potential for improving uh, biomass production uh, and drought uh, in barley. All right, so that's enough about drought. Uh, let's move on to salinity, sort of my um, pet research area. And salinity is really a global issue, maybe not so much uh, in North America, but if you look at the map and you look at uh, Australia, 
there are many areas that are not affected by salinity one way or another and it certainly affects ma the majority of the grain growing areas and also obviously um, Asia a lot of the area there is affected by salinity so when we talk about salinity there are two different types of stresses one is called the shoot iron independent stress or osmotic stress neither of those really uh, great names but we couldn't really come up with a better one so far so if you have a better one let us know and then there is the shoot iron dependent stress so shoot iron independent stress is really um, the immediate growth response of the plant as soon as they experience salt they reduce uh, shoot growth they reduce leaf expansion and leaf initiation um, the shoot iron dependent stress occurs at a later stage once you have uh, toxic levels of sodium and chloride accumulating in the leaves and you have early senescence of the plant. So two different uh, types of stresses that occur at different times uh, during exposure. So what we are trying to do with the phenotyping approach we are taking is what we call trait dissection. So we have a very complex trait and that can be yield, that can be nutrient use efficiency, can be salinity. So we have a whole range of individual traits that contribute to overall yield, for example. So what we are trying to do is try and identify the genetics um, or genetic variation for those individual traits, develop a robust screening protocol so that we can find the QTLs and genes that control the component traits and then see if they have an effect of yield in the field. So we're not trying to measure yield in the controlled environment and in the greenhouse in this case, because we know we're growing them in pots and there is limited correlation between yield in a pot compared to the field. So we're trying to find the genetics that control a subtrait and then test that uh, in the field. So for salinity, if we look at it, for sodium exclusion, which is one of the ways how plants can uh, become tolerant to a certain degree, we actually know quite a number of the genes. Uh, we know some of the transporters that are uh, good at sequestering sodium back out of the xylem. We know some of the transporters that can relocate it uh, from shoot back into the root. And the reason we do that is because measuring sodium content in the leaf is very easy. You cut off a leaf, digest it in nitric acid, measure it in a flame photometer, and you've got your value. So you can screen hundreds and hundreds of samples uh, in a reasonably short time. Very, um, I mean, it's reasonably labor intensive, but fairly cheap assay. For the osmotic tolerance or the shoot iron independent tolerance, so that growth reduction that we see under salt. We don't know really any of the genes at this point. And the reason for that is measuring growth at high throughput over time is really difficult and so far has been virtually impossible without having the continuous imaging. So what we are really trying to do is get a high throughput assay that we can use um, to then try and identify those genes. So I'm going to present a couple of case studies uh, to tell you about some of the screenings we've done um, before I then move on to sort of conclude. So before the plant accelerator was built, we had a small manual imaging system and you could grow plants in hydroponics, expose them to salt and then measure them manually. Obviously there was a limit to how many plants you could measure because your shoulders after a while get really tired and sore and also back in those days the analytics we used were rather basic and uh, fairly primitive so we grew plants under uh, control and salt and then we just fitted an exponential growth rate through those first few days after salt application and we used the ratio of those two relative growth rates um, to come up with a um, sort of shoot iron independence tolerance index. So I looked at a couple of different barley varieties um, and just highlighted here Clipper and Sahara. 
And you can see there isn't an awful lot of genetic variation uh, here present. At least so we thought at this point. Um, now we know that even small changes in relative growth rate actually have a reasonably big effect. But at that point, it was rather discouraging to try and go ahead with a whole forward genetic screen. However, once we then had a soil-based assay and we had conveyor belts and automated imaging system, what we now see is that Sahara and Clipper behave quite differently. So Sahara, a lot more tolerant uh, to the increasing levels of salinity compared to Clipper. Um, and if we look at uh, the shoot iron independent salt tolerance index in, for example, 250 millimolar sodium chloride, we can see that Clipper and Sahara are almost at opposite effects. So just changing from a hydroponics-based system to a soil-based system gave us a completely different result. So that's also something to keep in mind when you design your assays is that um, the way you grow your plants can have an effect on the results. So we then proceeded with screening a whole range of different mapping populations. Uh, this is a Mandakio population, and we did find QTL for some of the uh, growth-related traits. For example, here is estimated biomass on the last day. And we can see that depending on which allele the plants have, there is a significant difference, for example, in uh, estimated biomass on the last day. We then, for those QTL, tried to identify lines that differ in that specific locus of the QTL <laughs> with either the A or the B allele. Um, Subselected those lines, grew them in the field to measure grain yield in saline conditions. Um, and then once we adjusted for spatial variation within the field, we then tried to see do those QTL that we identify, do they have a yield benefit or are they potentially detrimental? So I'm not going to ask you to look at this entire table because there are way too many numbers. Um, but here at the traits, we looked at a whole range of different traits. In blue, you can see all the ones related to iron accumulation in the leaf. In green, all the ones related to growth responses. And in green is always when their yield based on the beneficial allele was improved more than 5% uh, of the average and red is when it had a detrimental effect. So the important part to take away from this is we definitely need to test in the fields to see what's happening. And also the field is not the field. Depending on what your salinity level is in the field and what also your uh, yield is in that year, so we have a 4.5 tons per hectare, which for Australia is pretty high. Um, 1.5 is probably closer to our average. So we are talking about a low yielding environment that we work in. Um, but you can see some of the uh, traits uh, or QTLs are beneficial in all conditions, both the high soil and the low soil and the high yielding and low yielding, uh, sorry, high yielding and low yielding environment. Others may be beneficial in one or the other. So it's really important to try and understand uh, under which conditions they help. Um, I now want to uh, give you an example of uh, an exper or a study that one of the PhD students in Adelaide did, where she went all the way from identifying a QTL for a with a candidate gene for a vacuolar pyrophosphatase in barley, to cloning the Arabidopsis uh, homolog overexpressing that uh, in Golden Promise. We now also have it in more elite cultivars adapted to Australia, um, and then studying the salinity tolerance of those lines. So we grew the plants uh, on the phenotyping system back in the early days when we had just started. And we can see that at completion of the experiment, 40 days after planting, that the, um, quite a number of the transgenics were larger than the uh, equivalent null line. When we looked at the relative growth rates, however, um, both at the early stages and later growth stages, we didn't see a faster growth 
for the transgenics compared to the nulls, possibly even a slightly slower growth. So we're like, well, how can they be bigger if they don't grow faster? And the answer was that on day nine, when we started imaging, those transgenics were already significantly bigger than the nulls. So what we've seen is that the bigger size at 47 days was really a result of early vigor very early on in the development. We've also tested those lines in the field in Western Australia in uh, sort of lowish salinity and the high salinity was probably a bit too high and was really pushing the plants to the limit. Um, so under low salinity, we can see that one of the lines had a significantly higher grain yield and the other one had a trend to a higher grain yield. If we now go to the high salinity side, first of all, you can see this isn't really an area where you should still be trying to grow crops. Nevertheless, what we can see is the wild type pretty much fails uh, in this area, whereas the transgenic still managed to produce uh, seed and actually yield. So what we've learned a from the studies we've done so far, field is not the field and whatever trade you're studying, you have to do it multi-location, multi-environment, multi-year. Um, but we can see that traits that we identify in the controlled environment can be beneficial in the field if we validate and test it. Um, and a gene that we hypothesize to really play a role in sodium exclusion can also play a more complex role, in this case actually increase plant vigor and also early vigor of the plant. So we've seen that growth analysis and just measuring the whole shoot over time is really powerful and can give us a lot of information. But the question is, can we get more out of it? Um, rather than treating the shoot as one object, if we look at individual leaves, can we get more information? So the challenge we set our colleagues uh, in computer vision was really, can we do 3D modeling rather than just 2D analysis? 2D is something that even I, with limited you know, computer experience, can achieve with the right software, but it treats a plant as a single object. 3D modeling, you really want to work with the experts. Um, problem is that it's often lower throughput because instead of just a couple of images, they you know, often require might be hundreds of images to get a 3D model. Um, but you can then get uh, information about uh, plant architecture. So the challenge we provided our colleagues at the Australian Centre for Visual Technologies was A, we want to work with small grain cereals, you know, no corn plant with nice big leaves and a somewhat symmetric uh, architecture. Now let's do the hard stuff. Let's do wheat and barley, thin leaves twisting around their axis, um, moving from one day to the other. Also, we said, well, we're not going to give you hundreds of images per plant because we want to do it at high throughput. You're getting five. That's it. Um, and also, I didn't want a nice 3D model of the plant that I can have spinning in my PowerPoint presentation. I wanted to know what's in that 3D model. How many leaves does that plant have? How long are those leaves within that 3D volume? So a few years later, they then came back <laughs> with the results. So what we're doing is we're using basic foreground background separation to segment the uh, shoot out of the plant. Uh, we then divide that individual segments um, so that is in C here, which we are then trying to connect to form a path first in 2D, but then later translate that into 3D, knowing the camera configurations. And we do that by using prior knowledge about the plant. So in E, F, and G, for example, you see that the computer could find different ways of connecting the individual segments, but we know that F and G, that's not how a plant grows. Um, so we can use prior knowledge to train the computer and say really E is the most likely model that fits through those images. So we then generate um, tens of thousands of models that fit into the 3D volume that we've identified. 
um, and we then use the one that is most likely to produce the images that we captured. And we can then trace individual leaves over time. Um, and we can do that even if, you know, leaf three here decides to move from one day to the other and shift position. Um, one thing we can't do yet, we can't tell um, blade and sheath apart. So we're measuring from the base of the pot all the way to the tip. And also at the moment we can't differentiate between a side tiller and the main tiller. Um, so leaf five is not necessarily leaf five on the main tiller, but the fifth leaf to emerge. And in this case, that would be um, the first side tiller. So putting things to the test, can we do growth analysis uh, in barley, for example? So we've got parents of a mapping population, Manda and Kiel. And we can see if we look at whole shoot analysis that Manda is a lot bigger than keel and also grows faster than keel. Does that hold true if we look at the 3D traits? So if we look at, for example, leaf four, we can see that the leaf four in Manda is a lot longer than it is uh, in keel. Um, and also that the absolute growth rate for leaf length is faster. However, what we see is that keel on average has more leaves. So even though it's smaller, it has more leaves, but because they are shorter than Manda, that overall results uh, in a smaller plant. So instead of just knowing one is smaller than the other, we now know that the smaller one has shorter but more leaves compared to the other one that has really long um, but slightly less leaves. We then grew a whole uh, population of recombinant inbred lines uh, under moderate levels of salinity um, to sort of reduce growth and we did image analysis both for the 2D and the 3D traits. What you can see is that leaf 1, 2 and 3, there isn't really a difference between the control and the salt and that is because leaf 3 was nearly fully elongated by the time was, uh, that we applied salt. Um, so they obviously don't have an effect. But if you then go to leaf four, which emerges as we apply uh, salt, you can see that that then has a reduction uh, between control and salt. Um, the other thing you can see is if you go, for example, to the later, so leaf, uh, the eighth leaf to emerge, you can see that also under control, we have more leaves across the population. So more plants with the leaf eight compared to the salt stress plants where many of the plants didn't have a leaf eight uh, emerge during the experiment. So we then uh, went ahead with QTL mapping. Um, we used both the 2D and the 3D traits. We used the straight estimate of biomath and length, but we also used the uh, rates of change. And we used individual time points and also intervals across which we measured. Um, overall, we found 65 significant QTL. All of them had a fairly low uh, lot score. And that indicates to us that most of those traits are controlled by many genes of minor effect. We had a lot more QTLs under soil conditions compared to control, which isn't too surprising because with this soil application, we sort of perturb the system um, and almost yeah, trigger a response. And we also had more QTL if we look at the rates rather than the absolute values, which indicates that this is possibly a type of analysis uh, you want to do. So we found some sort of QTL hotspots where a lot, multiple of the traits we measured located um, across several of the chromosomes. I'm just going to talk a bit about the key results. We found some of the usual suspects that you do in most growth analysis. So things like uh, photoperiod related uh, genes, flowering time genes. Um, we also found uh, some signaling and potassium transporters. Not too surprising uh, given that we are adding salinity. And we found several QTL that were both for leaf length and leaf number uh, locating to the same QTL 
but we also had distinctive one where it's either leaf length or leaf number, meaning that we might have the possibility to uh, manipulate those traits separately, so the leaf length and the initiation of leaves. The most significant QTL we found um, for leaf length 4, for example, was on 3H, and we only found that very shortly after salt application, and then it disappeared. And under that QTL, we had uh, six annotated genes. Three, according to the public databases, weren't expressed, certainly not in seedlings. And then we had two expansins and one... Uh, beta glucosidase, so all three involved in cell wall modification. So given that this is a leaf length genes, um, those are quite good candidates to pursue further. Now going from capturing images all the way to the QTLs, I just want to give you an overview of all the different analytics and computer programs involved. Um, and pretty much most of these steps is a different person uh, working on it. So we have the experimental design, we have the image acquisition, we have the 2D and the 3D analysis. On the other hand, we have the genotyping, the population structure, the linkage map construction. Then we have the phenotypic analysis uh, using uh, different stats packages in R combining it into QTL mapping and finally candidate analysis. So what you can see is this is not a straightforward, you know, we are taking images one day and a week later we have the QTLs. Um, it is a quite involved process and requires a lot of different expertise to come together. So what we are hoping to do in the future is do that at sort of larger throughput. Um, we've changed our imaging setup so that instead of just five images, we can now provide 19 images to our colleagues in half the time that it took us to do the five images previously. Um, and also we are hoping that with the different camera setup, we can maybe try and look at can we look at blade and sheath separately and get a bit more detail uh, in the future. So now we've got plenty of data. What do we do next? Typical experiment might take for us about 4 to 12 weeks. Um, but the analysis of the data often takes a lot longer. And we are talking months, maybe even years. So the question we ask ourselves, how do we enable plant scientists without the computer skills to query those large data sets? In the past, when we sent them the numeric data as CSV or Excel or any other format, they generally opened it, got scared, closed it, and um, yes, a few months later they might say, so about this data set, um, what do we do about it? So the question is, how do we reconnect the plant scientists who were used to working in the greenhouse, you know, looking and talking to their plants on a daily basis to now an experiment where they are nearly hands off once they're on the conveyor system and then get data in the end. How do we reconnect them to sort of ask the right questions? So we've invested in a software tool called Zegami, which was developed by a startup company in Adelaide to enable users to query their data. And this can be done now on the fly. So within 24 hours of taking the images, the users have the ability to at least look at the preliminary data analysis. And users that are, for example, off-site can also check and it's like, OK, this drought stress I'm applying seems to knock them quite hard. Maybe we want to increase the watering. So for users who are not in Adelaide, but somewhere else in the world or in Australia, they can log in remotely to monitor how their experiment is going. So we've got a number of data sets already publicly available, and you can scroll through them and play with the data later on. Um, you can you give a little bit of background about what the individual images are, and there's generally a link to the publication as well if the data set was published. Um, so in this case, I'm just showing you some examples from a rice data set. 
Um, this particular experiment, sorry, that was not intended, has about 14,000 images in it. Now, obviously, you don't have the time to look at 14,000 images. So you can look at individual images, and it'll directly provide you with all the information that is associated with that image. What variety was it? Um, was that a control or a salt stress plant? At what time was it taken? How much water did it use on that day? Where in our greenhouse was it located? And so on. So over here on the left-hand side, we have all the numeric data um, that is associated with the data set and that we can use to query it. So we can, for example, plot on the fly time of the planting against projected shoot area. We can color code, for example, by the different treatment, control in pink, salt here in green. And then there are two points down here, which I'm not sure you can see on the screen, that are control plants. And they're obviously very small. So you might ask, well, what's going on there? Is that an outlier that we might have to remove? You can just circle those two points and the software will automatically pull out the images for you on the fly. And you can then look at those plants. So these are meant to be control plants, but clearly they never grew in the first place. So that is then uh, a point where you might advise the statistician, look, these plants may have to be removed from the data set. So the tool is not replacing statistical analysis. It's just allowing you to get a feel for the data and then in conversation with the statistician say, look, I think there's something interesting happening, you know, between 34 and 37 days or whatever you might see. Um, to then uh, advise how the uh, data is going to be analyzed. And then you would have the full statistical analysis uh, later on. And that looks at potential outliers. We can provide time-lapse videos of individual plants to see what's happening. Um, but also we can look at, you know, which intervals should we analyze over the growth period. So the lessons we've learned over the last uh, nine years or some, what, it's plant phenotyping requires expertise from uh, many different disciplines. And having a team that's working effectively together is not a trivial exercise. And just because someone has deep subject matter expertise may not make them a good collaborator if they can't communicate and exchange ideas with, for example, a plant scientist. And one thing we have to realize is quite often we speak different languages. Um, you know, when I talk about leaf five, I clearly mean leaf five on the main tiller. That's pretty obvious. Um, but a computer scientist is like, well, the fifth leaf to emerge is surely leaf five. I mean, how can you possibly distinguish between one leaf and the other. Um, and also, you know, if we think about model, you know, if I as a plant scientist talk about a model, I might talk about Arabidopsis or rice or Brachypodium. A statistician might think of models as a mixed model analysis. A computer scientist may think of models as something completely different yet again. So it's just being aware of the fact that, you know, what is perfectly obvious for one discipline is something completely new to the other one. But the hard work pays off um, and we can gain insight into physiological traits that we wouldn't have been able uh, previously. And with that, I'd like to thank a whole range of our different collaborators and also funding primarily from the federal government in Australia to keep our facility open and running. Thank you very much. So for those of you that are online, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the window. Bettina can see them here in the room. Raise your hand if you have a question and we'll try to do a little back and forth now. Well, I have a question. Yep. So um, you compare, let's say, the results you got from the QTL analysis mm -hmm. and so on, compared to what's been from mutational analysis. Did you end up with any of the same genes, for example, some of the saw genes? 
Um, we do find, yeah, so we do find some sort of key loci that reappear um, often for some of the key transporters, for example, um, that we find, that we knew, for example, historically from some of the Arvidopsis work even, um, that we do find in QTL analysis. Um, as far as the growth QT QTL are concerned, we had no idea before, so a lot of those things we don't know. Are we looking for transcription factors? Are we looking for kinases? Are we looking for structural enzymes and genes like the um, expansins, for example, that we found uh, in that analysis? We're pretty much um, right at the beginning of trying to figure out how does a plant actually decide whether to keep expanding the leaf or not, or whether to initiate a new leaf or not. So we don't know enough to say how one compares to the other at this point. Other questions? Okay, I've got one here. So you mentioned that the facilities are open to the public. Can you share what are the opportunities to work and have training at APPF? Yes. So there are different types how you can use the facility. One is if you have existing uh, grant funding, then you can really just send us an email uh, about a potential project and we would start the discussion of how this can be facilitated. For postgraduate students, we have a internship program and we have two calls per year. And I think the next one is closing either end of this week or next week. Um, and you can then, if you're successful, get uh, a phenotyping project supported. Um, there's also a bit of travel support uh, in that grant as well. And you would then work alongside our team to learn as you run your own experiment. That would obviously have to fit into your PhD or master's program. Thank you. Are there All any right. other questions? Joe. Could you talk a little bit more about the uh, engagement with the private sector? Yes. A lot of the technologies and resources you're talking about are federally funded. Mm -hmm. What about the private sector? Yeah. So for those online, the question was about private sector engagement and how that works. So we have different um, pricing structures. So publicly funded research is as a highly subsidized rate so that it's really just marginal cost recovery. Industry, given that they generally don't share their data after we collect it and keep that private, we charge a higher rate. Um, and the types of experiments we've done can be anything from validation of um, compounds that they have in their pipeline and almost doing a blind trial. Um, can be anything from testing some of their elite germplasm um, or potentially novel fertilizer formulations or so on. Um, so that's one option where it's a straight one-on-one -on -one service agreement. Uh, in Australia, there's also a thing called ARC linkage grants where researchers in industry partner and leverage industry investment to get co-investment from uh, the Australian Research Council. Um, in that case, they would generally be treated as public funded research experiments um, because there is a um, IP shared agreement in place with the um, public uh, researcher prior. So yeah, different models depending on whether it's straight industry money coming to us as a one-on-one -on -one service provision or whether it's a collaborative project with public researchers that then engage us. Let's thank Bettina for this excellent seminar.